Yeah. Order, order, and welcome uh, to today's session of uh, the Transport Select Committee. Uh, my name is Ian Stewart, I'm the, the chair of the committee. Um, if I could just start with a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, it is rather warm today, so if colleagues or witnesses wish to take off jackets, loosen ties, uh, do feel free to do so. Uh, and could also ask, remind colleagues to introduce themselves uh, by name uh, when uh, asking uh, a question. Uh, could I ask uh, each of our witnesses, uh, please, just to introduce their name and uh, position, please? If I could start uh, with Mr. Anderson. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, my name is Stephen Anderson. I am registered as blind. I also have Asperger's syndrome. Um, my guide dog is uh, my guide dog Barney is at my feet at the moment, and I would class myself as a an accessibility campaigner. Thank you, and welcome to to Barney uh, to our proceedings, uh, Baroness Gray Thompson. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tanya Gray Thompson. I'm a cross bench peer, uh, a wheelchair user. And I've been campaigning for 30 years for better accessible transport. And I don't mean to start off by being flippant. However, I just want the same miserable experience of commuting that a non-disabled person has. And we are nowhere near that. Thank you. My name is Christiane Link. I'm a consultant and I advise the aviation and transport industry for over 20 years um, regarding accessibility and how to improve their customer experience for disabled customers, I'm a wheelchair user and um, I consider myself as a member of the disability community. Thank you. And Mr. Benson. So I'm Alan Benson. I'm an activist and campaigner. Uh, I am chair of Transport for All, the Disabled Rights uh, Transport Charity. I'm deputy chair at Travel Watch. I'm a founder member of the Campaign for Running Border. Uh, I'm on the South West Rail Accessibility Panel um, and a number of other hats. But today I'm appearing in my own right in a personal capacity. Thank you very much and, and welcome all. Um, the, our purpose in this inquiry, and this is the first of the oral evidence sessions uh, we're having, uh, is to consider both uh, whether the existing legislation and regulations uh, covering uh, access to transport is sufficient or are there gaps, and where there's a uh, a lack of enforcement of uh, regulations that are already there. And, uh, in this session, my, my colleagues and I will want to explore in detail some of the specific issues. Uh, but if I could start with, uh, to invite you all to make a very general observation. Uh, in 2018, the government stated that it wanted everyone to travel easily, confidently and without extra costs. From your perspective, what's the reality today? How? How comprehensive is that uh, transport statement uh, from your experiences? Uh, Mr Anderson, if I could ask you to uh, start, please. I think it's a very binary thing. In my experience, there's no such thing as an OK trip. It either goes very, very well or goes very, very wrong. I've had experiences where, if I take the example of um, private hire vehicles, I've now had 43 separate refusals where a driver has failed or refused to take me because of the presence of Barney and that does not necessarily set you up very well for a good morning of work or if you're going out just wanting to enjoy yourself. I have also been denied access to a cruise liner even though I turned up and had submitted all my paperwork um, beforehand and was advised that the equality legislation because it is a ferry, uh, because it is a cruise does not cover that, uh, despite that being the case in the United States and in other places. I've also found that abuse from members of the public is quite common. Um, if I take Baker Street Station alone, I have had abuse hurled at me in the last 12 months three separate times, all of which have contained the line, and I apologise for the language, you're not fucking blind. And the police have done the square root of nothing about those things 
and I do have some ideas on that to really tighten that up as well as access refusals um, for private hire vehicles and indeed for cruise liners. Thank you. That is appalling that uh, you uh, receive that, that abuse. Um, and I'd like to pick up on some of the, those points in a moment. But uh, Nick, if I could ask uh, Baroness Ray Thompson, and could I also ask you, I've had a note from our sound engineer, if you could move your laptop slightly away from the microphone, uh, that, would, that would help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the simple answer to the question is no, that public transport routinely fails disabled people. Um, I was asked recently by a train operating company, give me an example of an amazing experience. And I'm afraid uh, I have slightly slipped into being able to get on and off a train. I get very excited about and, you know, being able to get on and off in a timely manner. And that is not uh, an amazing experience. So when you take in the extra time it takes to plan, uh, to travel, uh, mainline train stations now expect a wheelchair user to be there more than 30 minutes before the train, we have such a different experience. So this is partly a failure of legislation. So I sat on the National Disability Council, which oversaw the implementation of the DDA. We were promised January the 1st, 2020, everything would be fine. Um, Scope's uh, latest figures is that is going to be 2070 before there is step-free access to the platform, not even the train. And I think the government's own stats uh, are talking about 100 years. So in my lifetime, I will not be able to get on a train without the permission or support of a non-disabled person. Um, and there's a complete failure to enforce. Um, we're constantly told it'll never happen again, it's just you, we're really sorry, and we're expected to go away. And I think one of the most offensive things I experience is um, turning up at a train, so I live in the northeast of England, so I use trains a lot, maybe 150 train journeys a year. Um, it's, you're asked, did you book? Mm. Um, and it's a constant negation of the fact that we have lives, we have work, we have families, we um, are constantly treated differently. And uh, if anyone follows me on social media, I do tweet a lot about my particularly train journeys because that's what I take most of. Um, but I am treated incredibly differently to the vast majority of disabled people I know, either because I used to be an athlete or because I sit in the House of Lords. And as a mainline train station recently, where they reluctantly put me on a train because I was told, you're the person who tweets. And it's like, yeah, I am. Yeah. And so I, I think uh, we, we just have to recognise there are a lot of disabled people who just don't have the time, energy, the folk to be able to complain every single time because our complaints are generally battered away. Thank you. Christian. I think one of the biggest barriers to travel by, ra by train is the lack of reliability of the service. So every passenger who had a so-called failed assist, that means you board a train and no one is there at the other end, so you might either get overcarried or you have to find some kind of solution, go on the floor, drag your wheelchair out of this huge gap, it's a health and safety issue as well, will be really anxious the next time traveling. And I, when I joined the railway industry, my biggest surprise was how bad the situation really is. I always considered myself a bit unlucky. Maybe that's just me, I have some bad trips. And then I saw really inside how bad the situation is. And this is a problem because the industry ha is used to this failed assists. They got used to it. There is no awareness anymore that this is not okay because it virtually happens. Not virtually, it happens every single day. Staff members are used to it. So we are not talking about uh, changing a system. We also have to change the culture in the industry from the top down. That means the DFT must give a clear message that this is not acceptable anymore and that there will be severe issues if this doesn't stop. <laughs> Second, I think there's a responsibility with the managing directors, with everyone who has a C in the title, in train operating companies, to say, we go for accessibility. I don't accept failed assists anymore. 
this culture is not acceptable anymore and we really want to serve disabled people well because it is their right to travel. You can see it in the language. The industry is talking about people with access needs. I don't have an access need. Everyone has an access need. You don't want to sit on the platform. You want to actually travel the tra uh, on the train. I have a right to travel. And this information is not filtering through into the transport industry that disabled people have a right to travel even before 1995, I hope, before the DDA was there. But it is really, really important that we get the culture change and that can only be driven from the top. It will not work if you wait for an accessibility manager at a train operating company changing a culture of, of a huge organization of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. Where to start? Um, in front of you, the four of us, we know each other. We know each other because we share a common experience. We share techniques to overcome the barriers that we face on a daily basis. We are four and representing a network of hundreds, if not thousands, of people that share the same experience. In the last three months, I've had to pull the passenger alarm three times on three separate trains. This is not unusual because the train is cancelled because the train the assistance doesn't turn up to get me off so the only way that I can escape is to pull that alarm. I've been stuck on a bus for two hours because the ramp failed. Journeys for me a journey is going to go wrong. I expect something's going wrong. It's just how badly it goes wrong. Doesn't mean I'm delayed 10 minutes. Doesn't mean I'm delayed three hours. Give you some idea of the scale of the impact. Uh, Transport floor has its offices in Brixton. When the lift was out at Brixton, for six months for refurbishment, I calculated the extra travelling time it takes to use the bus. So this is the kind of thing. Stations, I think it's a quarter of stations have got lift access. So if I'm not using, I'm not going to use a bus to go to the station, this is the kind of impact. In six months, I spent three weeks traveling on the bus extra. 20 minutes extra a journey. So that's the kind of impact that, that we expect as disabled travelers. Um, the short answer to the inquiry question, no. The legislation isn't effective. The question that we've got to ask is, what have we got to do Thank you very much and as I said at the outset that is the objective of this inquiry is to look at both the effectiveness of uh, existing legislation and regulations uh, and where there might be gaps that, that need to be filled. Um, if I could turn now to my colleagues to, to follow up uh, some of the points that you've made. And uh, Gavin Newlands, if you could uh, start us off, please. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Chair. My name is Gavin Newlands. I am uh, the MP for Paisley and I'm sure North uh, and SNP Transport spokesperson as well. So good morning uh, to you all. Um, the written evidence that we've received um, for this inquiry uh, details pretty clear failures across all transport uh, modes from taxis to, to planes, trains, etc, etc. Obviously anybody that does follow Tani on trains can't help to um, to notice the kind of lived experience and if, if and as you said, if, if you're getting that experience 
um, then it could only be worse uh, for, for everyone else. Um, but does that, that the, the fails across all transport modes, does that reflect your experience? I'm, I'm assuming the answer is probably yes. So if you if you disagree with that statement, then then please say so now before I move on. So the fails across all transport modes is the um, everyone would agree with. Yeah. Can I ask therefore? Would you think, and I'll start with you, Mr. Benson, what mode of transport is probably um, the worst? Um, and perhaps in answering that, if you could perhaps tell us what mode of transport has improved its accessibility or is improving its accessibility quicker than other modes? Can I start by defining what a mode of transport is? Sure. So I think a lot of the evidence that's been submitted talks about trains or taxis or there's some vehicle in the world. But I think it's important that we also consider, particularly in, as climate change and active travel becomes important, modes of transport include walking, yeah. cycling. <clears throat> so we are talking about the streetscape as well. Yeah. So it's not just as Tony has said, failure to be uh, assisted on trains, it's roadworks that make streetscapes inaccessible. So the legislation is not just the Equality Act, it covers the whole plethora of the journey from, from door to door. Um, Which is worse? That's such it's a really hard question to answer. One, I think one of the big issues is that we don't know the scale of the problem. The data isn't captured. I picked up in the evidence that was submitted that Southeastern uh, said they only had. 300 and something incidents a year. That's rubbish. Um, certainly, I was one of those incidents. Well, I was an incident on South Eastern where I was overcarried, but I didn't report it. I, they don't have that statistic because it's the complaint procedures exist, but if every journey I take has one or more failures, I'm not going to complain about every journey. It's just too tiring. It, I don't have enough personal resource to, to, come, to, to pursue those complaints. So it goes unmeasured. Um, <coughs> Personal experience is that the biggest failures happen to me on the railway because that's the one with the biggest barriers, but the most frequent failures happen on the bus. Mm. And it's that so often either a failure of the ramp or the conflict with buggies. But I don't register them, I don't care what. So I, I'm afraid I can't answer your question. There is no worst. Okay. Um, as it got better, in the 10 years I've been doing this, it's gone up and down. It has gotten better in some companies. It got a bit better before COVID. Since COVID, it's got worse again. Mm. So, can I ask just, you mentioned, and you're absolutely right, about streetscape and street environment and, and obviously the, the big move <coughs> that has got on to, uh, towards active travel um, at the moment. Um, and also e-scooters and e-bikes. So in terms of access to even to buses or access to streets, 
obviously we've seen some complaints about some active travel schemes that have become an issue for um, people accessing a bus or even just walking or trying to uh, walk the streets and also the clutter from e-bikes etc. Perhaps you want to comment on your experience with that before I move on. No, I'm sure Stephen will have sure. yeah. a lot to say on this. Um, E-bikes particularly for me are they're litter. Mm. They're, they're absolutely everywhere. Um, I carry or I have on the back of me a fluorescent rucksack. Um, there's a number of reasons for that that I might go into later. But one of them is so that when I do detours into the road, which I have to do very frequently, and I'm visible to traffic. Um, it's a conscious decision for my own safety. And I think that's something that's worth saying about all of the transport ones Whereas you, as a, a, a passenger, are likely to get on a train or to embark on a journey, thinking about your destination, I'm thinking about what I can do to make that journey safe and successful. Sure. Okay, thank you. So, um, Mr. Anderson, so the, the, the wider question with regards to different modes of transport, but obviously um, the specific issue with regard to um, active travel schemes and the design thereof um, and the other street clutter. Um. Yeah, so in, in terms of e-scooters and the like, um, they, they, they are, they're not e-scooters, they're e-fly tipping to me. Because when, when I navigate with Barney, he'll just stop, which is what he's trained to do and he does very well with it. But we end up with a problem where he then basically stops and then I have to go, right, now I've got to go into the road. And this is where we get to a point where my head starts going, but I want everybody to be green, I want everybody to act in an environmentally friendly way, but this can't continue. Equally, if I raise a concern about this, am I going to be shamed, particularly on social media, for daring <laughs> to suggest we should do something that might discourage people from using e-scooters in, in, in a minuscule way? And I think that's, there's that juggling act um, that that we really have to to, to take into a, well that, that mentally just, I think as a disabled person I have to take into account but I feel comfortable saying that here I think we need some form of enforced docking like you do with the um, the, the Boris bikes in central London uh, assuming they're they're all docked of course um, but I remember when I was at school St Vincent School for sensory uh, sorry I'll start that again St Vincent School a special school for sensory impairment and other needs. I was told that as you grow up, your independence is going to be compromised and your incidence of discrimination are going to go up. And I thought at the time that my mobility teacher was talking absolute nonsense. Unfortunately, she was absolutely right. Um, if, I, if I talk about what um, modes of transport have got better, the answer is approximately zero. Um, and in terms of what's getting worse, well, the number of re refusals I've had to... Um, taxi and private hire vehicles has doubled since the end of the last lockdown. Um, indeed, guide dogs have said that uh, the number of refusals has gone up from 75% to 81% um, of people have been refused access in the last year. 61% of visually impaired people feel lonely. And these are all things that we have to take into account. And I think even the, the, the idea that when I was kicked off Fred Olsen cruise lines and I've waited six years to say that publicly um, it, it, the, the whole thing of having to think seven steps ahead and, uh, is, 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 what, is, is my journey going to be less bad than it was last time um, it's just if, it, when, it, when it goes well it goes very well but that is extremely rare um, and going, going extremely well means it went okay I mean even, even today my journey without, went without fault and then I got to the doors of Portcullis House and a member of security grabbed me violently. And I'm sorry to bring that up to the committee, but I was not very impressed. And the security guard shouted at me for about 90 seconds total. 
I stood up for myself and stood my ground. But that's an example of the kind of attitude that we're dealing with a lot of the time. So I thought I'd just put that on the record. Can I just say, before I go back to Mr Newlands, um, <coughs> thank you for raising that with us. Uh, and I apologise on, on behalf of Parliament that you've had that experience. Uh, we will be taking it up uh, with the security uh, people here uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. But again, I apologise on, on Parliament's behalf uh, for that, that experience you had. It's not acceptable. Uh, Gavin. No, thanks so much, Chair. Um, Tani, obviously your experience of trains has already been touched on thus far, so is there perhaps experience on other uh, modes of transport? That, um, and uh, have you seen any improvements? I mean, we've now got, for instance, for talking bus regulations and finally in place that was just taken far, far too long. Just, just one instance, but um, other examples for you? Or good or bad? The reality is it's so variable and so yeah, much of the time, yeah, we're reliant on people yeah. rather than policies, procedures and infrastructure. <coughs> so, you know, one of my frustrations is the 2012 Paralympics were incredible, the best moment of my entire life, but there's some real tick box compliance that because we had the games, I'm constantly told to change the world for disabled people. So we might now have ramps on taxis in London but it's reliant on the taxi driver. So I had an amazing experience last week where a taxi driver stepped in, helped me in a situation. But I'm the same, I've, I've had so many transport failures. Um, and rather than reiterating what's been said, because I support um, both comments already, the impact since COVID has been a real challenge. So during COVID, the wheelchair space didn't count as a seat. So the number of times I got refused, even though I booked the wheelchair space, Train companies wouldn't let me buy the ticket because it wasn't a seat, and I'll, I'll write to the committee with more detail about that. That shows the complete lack of priority, that um, wheelchair spaces on buses and trains are quite often filled with luggage. It's down to the individual to remove them. Um, airlines, I've had to fill in a form uh, a couple of years ago, admittedly, where the form said, would my impairment likely cause offence to other passengers? Uh, no. What, um, what your lane was that? Uh, I'll write to the committee about it. It's not, it's not, <laughs> actually, it's not just one airline. Okay, fair enough. And, and some of that's got worse. So um, routinely now, disabled people are being told they're not allowed to fly on their own because of health and safety. Yeah. Anyone looks at Sophie Morgan's Twitter feed will see that her wheelchair has been damaged yet again. The biggest challenge is when you get on a flight, will your chair even arrive or will it arrive in one piece? Just some bills. on. Um, we need to be looking at cars um, and blue badge parking. So York has uh, recently gone through... A uh, big kerfuffle about removing blue badge parking. Uh, the abuse of that, I think, is is something that that we need to, to be looking at. Um, I tried to change my car to an electric car last year. Couldn't do it because of the complete inaccessibility of any electric charging points anywhere near where I live. Um, up steps too far away. Again, disabled people are going to be battered over the head when you know we're asking the country to move to electric charging vehicles and disabled people can't do that. Uh, try and get an electric wheelchair accessible vehicle. In the United States, they cost at least $30,000 more. So, um, you know, it, it's not moved on. And when you've got a company like ScotRail that bans scooter users, you know, um, because one time somebody did something with a scooter, so uh, every scooter user is now banned. So I am in discussion with ScotRail about changing that policy. So you mean uh, mobility scooters? Mobility scooters, yeah. So, so my solution, which I came in on this morning, I've got a battery pack extension to, to my wheelchair. Very expensive, uh, at least £5,000. But I have that so I don't have to use public transport because it's so unreliable that you can't base your life on, on, on trying to, to, to use it. Um, and because the hours we work here, you know, getting home late at night or early in the morning, it's just... So I'm, again, I'm in an unfortunate position to do that. Um, I should say the, these are not. There's no legislation that covers them, and and we need to be looking at that because actually, if we pass any legislation that inadvertently bans these beyond my personal use of it, we will be having a, a massive detrimental effect on thousands of disabled people who um, will, will find it even harder to get around than they currently do. Okay, Christian, anything to add? Yeah, I think we um, since COVID. Um, the society is not used anymore to disabled people and you can see that in every form of transport 
the standards are so low at the moment. Uh, Check-in staff that they don't know how to book a battery in from like a device. Mm -hmm. I have the same device as Tani. <laughs> um, uh, that is a standard uh, lithium battery. I put in my hand back. That is, is not dangerous. <coughs> It took me 90 minutes last week to check this battery in. Basically, nobody knew which form, who to call, whatever. Um, and, then, and then they asked me at the end, what's the weight of the battery? 500 grams? I don't know. So um, there, there are no standards anymore. That was not the case before COVID. There were routines. People were used to see wheelchair users, other disabled people. Um, cane users, guide dogs, and so on. That has totally dropped, and that has a massive impact on disabled people at the moment. That's why we need a massively proactive approach by the regulators. Mm -hmm. If the regulators don't stop that, basically now, we will go further downhill in the next couple of years because the standards and the processes are not there. I know a lot of organizations had to train their staff quite quickly after COVID, uh, passengers' numbers were, were going up qu more quickly than expected. That's good news, actually. I understand what the challenges are, but again, we need proactive uh, uh, regulators, both for aviation uh, and for transport, for rail and so on. It can't be that we, as disabled <coughs> passengers, are now playing the role of ORR inspectors saying, hello, there's another non-compliant ramp which should be replaced before mm -hmm. COVID already. Mm -hmm. that is, that's not our role and that is not acceptable in any other areas of life. I mean, you can't do your MOT yourself. You have to go to someone. So why do I have to regulate now the services I use, then have to go to the regulator and say, hello, can you please do something about it? So I think we need more proactive approach by the regulators, they need more resources, they need enforcement powers, mm. it will not go without it, even so I, I fully understand the ATP is a good frame, ORR framework, it's good, it is far better than what we had before, the same is true for the, for the 11.07.2006 in, in aviation, it is we came a long way, I fully understand that, but now is the time because of the downhill of the standards in the services that someone has to stop this uh, direction because it will have a, it already has a massive effect on disabled people. Mm. It will have an impact on their health. Traveling means health, traveling means access to employment, access to quality of life. If I just sit at home, that is, Transport has a purpose. People want to go on holidays. They want to enjoy their life. I go on business trips all the time. That's how I earn my money. Why should I stop that? But I need the support of the regulators and the people in charge to make sure that the standard is acceptable. Otherwise, it becomes unbearable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to Graham Morris. That, that's Jeff. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my name is Graham Morris. I'm the <clears throat> Labour Member of Parliament for. Uh, Easington in the northeast of England, same region as Tanny actually, um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to follow up on, on on some of the answers you've just given. But can, can I first of all ask: Are any members of the panel members of the Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Committee? No. I, I was reading a piece in Disability News, and the, the, uh, there was a lot of criticism of the regulators, and it's interesting the points that have been made that it should be down to policy, uh, uh, you know, driven policy, adopted policy, not down to the goodwill of individuals, uh, you, you know, either, either a, an ind individual driver or a, or, or a person on a, a, on a train to, to improve the situation. But what, 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 is, what, is, what is your view of the role of the Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Group? Uh, the, the criticism that I read was that they weren't being transparent. You know, uh, when when there was criticism of ministers and policy, they weren't for, forthcoming with freedom of information requests. Is that a fair criticism? Uh, Tanya, are, are you aware of this? Um, so for disclosure, I do know the the new chair of of DipTac. Um, yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that. Uh, and I, I'm not aware of, of all the detail behind that. I've, I've, I've read the, the news bulletins. Um, I don't think most people 
uh, disabled people probably know DipTag exists or what it's meant to do. Um, you try and explain something like the rail or public transport industry to anybody, 47 pieces of paper later, you, you yeah. might have, have an answer. I think what I, I have read in terms of uh, the priority around DipTag just doesn't seem to have had any priority within DFT. So, you know, over the years, I, I don't know how many ministers I've spoken to different people to try and raise up the, the priority list, and, and it doesn't get there. So, sorry, I can't specifically answer that question. I don't, I've never really had much to do with DipTag, perfectly. So, just to, just to reinforce the point you made early, uh, earlier that your colleague, <coughs> Mr. Yarn, made uh, about whether um, improving accessibility for disabled people is a priority for the department and for ministers, what, what, what is your opinion of that? I think if that is the case, the message is not landing where the people make the decisions yeah. in the organisations. I think we really need a strong voice, and I speak about the transport secretary, the railway minister, aviation minister. They have to bang the drum constantly and say accessibility is important. I expect that from my department, from from the train operators, from the airports and so on. And I don't hear that loud enough. It is, um, sometimes there are some statements on awareness days or whatever, and that is a bit um, window dressing, I would even say. We need actions actually, and that means a loud voice and then really checking, is that delivered? Is Network Rail really delivering at their station when it comes to accessibility, when it comes to delivering their footbridges? Why are they building inaccessible footbridges in 2023, uh, which have to be fixed in 20 years' time? So that is something where I would wish that politicians, people in charge, the department directors at the department say stop at an early point and say, that is not okay. The dip tech is important. I think all um, advisory groups of disabled people are important if they get listened to. If that's the case, I, I don't know. I don't have insights. But um, I chair the advisory group of East Midlands Airport. And I can say the airport is listening. We were, uh, they, the airport is rated very good by the CAA. They are winning prices now for their customer experience concept for disabled people. So it shows it is possible to achieve something when we are listening to disabled people, when it's a professional relationship. But we still need what I said at the beginning the top-down approach that this is important. They say, but people can't do the work on their own as well. There's no point having an advisory group if then nothing is actioned on. So I don't know if that's the case with LipTech, but I think it is important. I wonder if part of the problem is um, there are a number of regulators involved, aren't there? And, and is, it could, I mean, I don't know if there's a magic bullet, but just in terms of the work of this committee, in making recommendations to government. Um, do we need a czar? We do, do we need somebody with overarching responsibilities, um, given some, some particular powers by ministers in order to implement policy so we can see the evidence uh, of, of, an, of an improvement? I, I wonder if I might just ask Stephen, because I, I, I don't want to hog this session, but S Stephen, just in relation to your experiences there that you mentioned, you shared with the committee earlier on at, at um, uh, um, I forgot what it was at Brixton Station where, where the lift was out of operation. In another inquiry, we've pushed ministers and, and train operating companies um, and, and uh, uh, more generally over the issue of, of uh, ticket office closures. And part of their justification has been well, um, we'll have more staff available on the platform to help passengers with disabilities, you know, to get on and off trains and give advice and so on. Is that your experience, Steve? No, put, put, put very simply, it's, it's, it's a cover for having less staff. Um, and I've, I've actually found that if I, if I need assistance, I need a point where I can go to, rather than sort of run around all the platforms and sort of go, hello, is there any staff there? Yeah. I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't want to play a game of cat and mouse while going to work or um, going, go, going on a trip. 
But on, on the point about um, regulators and, and, and that sort of thing, I, I have often found that um, the sort of response I get to complaints that I make about disability discrimination, then they're, they're not taken as seriously as they should be. It should be considered appalling and outrageous, whereas the general response, if, if, we, if we use the, the scooter example um, with, with ScotRail, they haven't, even if lots of people have complained to ScotRail, not a lot has happened yet. Whereas when something happens the other way, bang, it happens. And that, that I think is very telling. And I remember talking to, um, and actually to, to go on from that, when I've had abuse in the, in the street, but sorry, when I've had abuse at Baker Street Station and I've raised these issues and said, what can we do? Can we try and fix something? I had a, I had a response from TfL the other day saying, we're going to do absolutely nothing about what's happened to you. And I, I, I spoke to a couple of friends about this privately. <coughs> and um, a, a number of friends came back to me and sort of said, oh, yes, that's disgraceful and all the rest of it. But actually one friend, I think, put it very, um, very succinctly. And I, I wasn't going to share this, but I'll share it with you. Um, they, they came back to me and just said, and, 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 and we can speak candidly, and I sort of said, I don't understand why TfL aren't listening to me. And she just came back to me and she said, you're disabled. You know you don't matter to them. You don't matter at all. And the problem is, she was absolutely right. And the problem is, is that with, with these regulators, there is no teeth. Yeah. There's absolutely no teeth. When, when we've had people who have had pros uh, taxi refusals, nothing has happened. Yeah. Prosecutions haven't occurred. Licenses haven't been revoked. These should be automatic. Somebody should be saying, excuse me, what, what's going on? I don't really feel that there's enough of a regulator to sort of bang the door down. And enough of this awareness stuff. Yeah. We actually need something to happen and for it to be made loud and clear from the highest echelons of government. This is totally unacceptable. We are not going to stand for it. And the sooner we can get to that position, the better. And um, here endeth the lesson. Professor, so that's, that's really helpful. You know, I, ju I just want to ask Alan if, he, if, if there's anything you can add to that. I think your, co your colleagues have been quite eloquent and forceful there. I, I agree with everything that they said. And I would add, no, I've not met anybody who goes to work without the intention and trying to deliver a good service, whether that's ministers, uh, bosses, managers, doesn't matter. They all um, go to work with the intention of delivering good service. It's how, how that's implemented. Now, I note from the evidence that's been submitted that almost everybody wants stricter enforcement and more regulation. Yeah. That's including the operators that are subject to these rules and regulations. So it's, it's consistency and knowing what it is that they need to do. If we look at the health and safety legislation that was implemented in 73, that's dramatically changed the accidents and the injuries yeah. across society. Yeah. But our approach to disability legislation is derogations. Yeah. We'll let, we'll avoid making coaches accessible for 20 years. Yeah. We'll avoid updating uh, stations or trains. It's all about, it's too expensive to do it now. It's all we'll do it next time. And until we treat accessibility like we treat health and safety, it's not going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks Alan, that's useful. Thanks Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg. Uh, to uh, Jack Brereton. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for all of the uh, hugely varied examples that you've given, both in terms of uh, those physical barriers and also some of uh, you know where processes are not really being followed effectively. Um, so, firstly, to to Christine, what Christina, why um, do you think it is that we're in this situation and it has got uh, so bad with some of these barriers? I think the most important point is 
the priorities are not right at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, yeah, we, we fell a bit behind or it was not the priority. It was, as, as Tani said before, 2012 was the best time of my life as well because we, we got it right. Everyone was well trained, the processes were clear, disabled people were welcome in society and that has totally changed since, since COVID. There is another, there's a different feeling and I think another problem is because the standards have fallen after COVID and because society is as it is at the moment, um, at the same time there was nothing to strengthen the regulators in the past 10 years. I think you have a good system. The OR, we don't need a SAR. <laughs> I don't think so. You need to strengthen the systems we already have in place. They need more staff, they need more money, they need more power. I think this is actually relatively easy to fix. We don't let other industries uh, treat customers in the way they're treating disabled customers. And I also think it's a matter of fairness. If you look at the, at the CAA ratings of, of the airports, there are airports rated very good. It's not a huge, it's not difficult to find out why that is the case. They invest in, dis, in their disabled customers. They have, they, they build new accessible toilets, they, they buy new amber lifts. And then there are others who get poorly or room for improvement, I can't remember how the, how the rating is called, or needs improvement, um, they don't invest, but then nothing happens. So it's also a, a matter of fairness. So why are they, okay, the airports get a good, a good or very good rating, and the others, so what's happening with them? So that's okay that they don't invest, that's not fair. So we need a regulator also to get economic fairness into the system, because if nothing happens, what, what's the problem then? Yeah, maybe a customer will complain, but again, it's also very difficult to complain in aviation because um, applicable is 1107. That is not a law where you can go to the court easily and say, hello, I got discriminated against, please give me compensation. Equality Act is not applicable as soon as you step onto a plane. It's gone. I can't get compensation, I can't sue the airport for treating me badly, it's quite difficult. It is a regulator-based regulator system, but the regulator is not strong enough in the UK. I just won a case in Switzerland, funny enough, um, against a Portuguese airline who denied me boarding from London. I went to Geneva and got um, denied boarding. Switzerland, not even a European Union country, based on European Union law, it went to court. I have no idea how, should, how I would achieve that. The same happened to me in the UK. So it's a bit absurd. Switzerland is enforcing the European Union law better than any other EU member state in the UK who was in the European Union and has a strong regulator. Something is somehow out of track. Tani, you obviously mentioned about the huge number of stations that we've got across the network mm. that are still not... Uh, DDA compliant and I heard you talk before about you know some of the huge challenges you've had with things like lifts not working and some of these problems how, how frequently are these sort of issues uh, happening and occurring? So I think the latest stats I've seen that any 1.2% of network rail lifts are not working right. um, and then if you, you look at something like the tube so recently I was trying to get to London Bridge and the lift was out no announcements on the platform uh, Legally, uh, TfL lost a court case to Doug Pauly where they're meant to put out signs at gate lines. That's not done. That wasn't done last week either when I was travelling on the tube. So, you know, we, we need to be more creative. So quite often lifts are seen as the answer instead of actually thinking um, more creatively about how you can wrap, you know, what Christian was saying about how can Network Rail build a footbridge that has steps in this day and age. It's about how, how did it get, get through? So I think what we're seeing as well is, oh, now we've got an app to book assistance. That's better than it used to be. But um, Tony Jennings, who I know has given evidence to the committee, he, he said, you know, um, an app can't deploy a ramp. Mm. You know, and so we're, we're being told life is better for us, but we're not necessarily seeing that in reality. So unless we actually bring a process of, of buying, you know, uh, low floor trains, actually, you know, 
actually starting to do something now, we are never going to get to the point to do it. And uh, again, I think something that Tony submitted was that the overspend on the Elizabeth Line on Bond Street is more than the government is spending on its access for all budget in total. And so, you know, it's we, this can't be a, allowed to, to keep happening. Um, but I think it's because, you know, Alan said, it's really hard to complain. And it's not reported, it doesn't c come up the system. So every time we're just told, it's just, it's just one person, it's just you, it's just unfortunate. Um, you know, um, as, as much as I really dislike, uh, you know, asking a non-disabled person to sit in a wheelchair uh, because it doesn't give you any uh, example of, of lived reality, you know, I'd ask any of the committee to come and travel with me somewhere. Or, or any of us, yeah. and actually see what our lived reality is like, because you can't just run to a train station and get on. And I really, through all of this, I've been really grumpy uh, about some of this, because there are really good examples of things that happen. My, my local train company's pretty good, you know, and, and there are lots of good examples. But the reality is getting on and off a train, or on and off a bus, or in and out of a taxi, without mishap, is just what people expect all the time. And I think the reality is, if you're non-disabled, you just don't see this because it's not in your frame of reference. It just never is. I mean, obviously we've seen quite a lot of disruption on the rail network with industrial action and things recently. Has that impacted on um, some of the assistance that is being provided to people with a disability? Um, so for, for that, I'm, uh, if my life is not disrupted any more than a non-disabled person's life is disrupted, I'm sort of okay with it. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, um, whether there's leaves on the line or something like that, that's not something, you know, because we're being treated the same. Yeah. Um, it's when, and apologies to keep bringing it back to trains, but, you know, uh, at, at so many um, mainline train stations, uh, the assistance desk is not open for the first train in the morning. So from King's Cross, when I want to catch the six o'clock in the morning train north, uh, the assistance desk doesn't open till gone seven. So it's things like that, exactly the same with the, the, the ticket office trying to find a member of staff. Um, if a train's cancelled, which happened to me on Sunday, you're running around Doncaster train station trying to find somebody to get me on. And then actually my assistance was cancelled halfway down. No one met me at King's Cross. Actually, somebody on the train obviously follows me on Twitter because I had five members of staff who got me off the train, which never happens. So, you know, it's the, the normal disruption is the normal disruption. But um, the rest of it, I, I think I probably spend a couple of hours a week longer than a non-disabled person, either planning or... Uh, so it, it's that extra time every single week that, that I spend just trying to get around the, the UK. Um, Stephen, you have mentioned about some of the barriers that um, particularly uh, partially sighted people are facing um, on uh, pavements with you know, obstructions and issues like that. Um, what are the barriers that people facing um, you know, on pavements? Because we, this committee has obviously talked a lot in the past about things like pavement parking and those sort of issues. Uh, are there you know, continued concerns about some of the barriers that um, blind and partially sighted people are facing which, in what is meant to be you know, a safe space uh, of, of pavements. Yeah, so I, I think e-scooters e are absolutely right. I, when, when I go to um, where I'm director of music, St Thomas's Church, Kensal Green, on a Sunday, uh, the road there, regularly I'm having to um, navigate e-scooters and there's nothing really I can do. I just have to sort of sulk go into the road and then come back in. Um, but in terms of vehicles, um, as, as a public servant, I, I'm able to, well, I've, I've learned the processes. So I'm able to very quickly get the council on the phone and go, excuse me, we've got the car here, get it moved, come on. Mm -hmm. But a lot of disabled people are not in a position, well, sorry, speaking for blind and partially sighted people specifically, um, and for whatever reason, are not in a position to do that, and it shouldn't be me going down a road, sort of getting my phone out like I'm um, like I'm some kind of, kind of enforcement officer all the time. Um, I'd love the salary to go with it, but it, it really does make life quite quite miserable. If I may tap back into something that was said earlier, and it was absolutely right that um, the Civil, Civil Aviation Authority and the, the Swiss case, I had the same problem with Fred Olsen cruise lines in that. 
the Equality Act and the Equality Legislation doesn't cover them at all. I had to settle out of court because there was absolutely no way that I could do anything about the way I had been treated and the way I'd been discriminated against. And there was just no teeth. So, so again, it comes back to this, we, we need a way to be able to, like many non-disabled people would consider as a given, have a single button <coughs> process to trigger action and not have to follow it up with hundreds of hours of emails, hundreds of pounds worth of litigation stuff going on, and just make it happen. And that, it's that simple. Disabled people, I think there were some stats from Scope the other week that said that the, um, disabled people have additional costs of uh, about £1,000 a month in addition to their, their other expenses. We, we don't have the finances, and, and let alone the, 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 the mental wherewithal, to follow up every single incident. And if we did, there'd be no time to sleep. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Uh, Alan, we've heard a lot about you know, some of the challenges and barriers that people are facing. To what extent does that then become uh, you know, too much of a barrier and people are just a, with a disability are just avoiding traveling altogether and staying at home? One of the dilemmas I've got about being here today is I want to paint to the committee a realistic picture of the things that we face mm -hmm. that we have to overcome. But I'm really conscious that this inquiry has attracted a lot of attention mm -hmm. in the disability community. And there are a number of people listening to this this morning. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to put them off track. Mm -hmm. There is already enough disincentive mm -hmm. that puts people off. Exactly. I spend a significant amount of my time online sharing my tips, my knowledge to try and get other disabled people trying. Mm -hmm. Something that's been touched on, and I just want to be explicit in this, all of the um, responsibility for chasing up failures lands with the disabled person mm -hmm. that's subject to it, subject to those failures, whether that's complaining through complex processes, whether that's using ombudsman, or whether it's actually resorting to the legislation. Um, I know Stephen, Christiane has talked about taking legal action. Mm. There are, I think, three solicitors in this country that will take action for you. Mm. There are a handful of barristers that will take it to the High Court. It comes down all the time to me as an individual having to be my own solicitor and go through those legal processes that are quite frankly scary and risky because there's significant financial risk. And the transport operators consider, I believe, the fines and the penalties cost of doing business. Then not it's easier to pay compensation and get us to go away than yep. to actually fix the issues. And is that having a direct impact on, you know, some people being able to travel at all? Is that absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean the I think the, the thing that's not come across this morning is in front of you today you've got Stephen with Barney uh, and you've got three wheelchair users. Mm -hmm. Our impairments are quite well understood. Mm -hmm. People know what assistance we need what a good environment looks like. Mm -hmm. The majority of disabled people, um, an increasing number, 
2,900 have uh, energy impairments, have <coughs> invisible impairments. They find it a much harder environment <coughs> because they're faced with lack of belief. They're faced with personal animosity <coughs> in some cases. So our experience as bad as it is, I believe there are people that have it a lot worse than I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. do. Do any of our other witnesses have any comments on the real impacts that people are facing because of these barriers? Is the you know particularly on the mental health impacts and the consequences that people are having to face by being basically cooped up in in their houses because they just can't? Yes. I think the complexity of the system alone is a problem. Mm -hmm. So I get so many requests by friends and friends of friends and friends of friends friends uh, asking me to plan their journey. Mm -hmm. So something is, and, in an, and they are not just because they don't know how to do it, but they are so anxious, they want to check with someone if they really got the system right. And the only solution to the and the system is so complex because it is inaccessible. So and what you need, in fact, is a rolling stock strategy. Yeah. We are still buying trains that don't fit into the tracks. In fact, massive step, massive gap. The complexity, or and that affects not just wheelchair users. My grandma stopped travelling when she was seventy because she couldn't lift her leg anymore. That is end of. So that prevents people from traveling because they know the system is complex. It's not made for them. So a big step and a big gap is not the ideal solution for someone um, who is older and, and might have arthritis in their knees. It's that simple that prevents people from, from traveling. You need a rolling stock strategy. You need to say to the rolling stock, companies from 2025. We will not buy a single train from you anymore that doesn't meet the UK platform height standard. That is half of the problem solved when it comes to access to trains, assistance. It, it, it affects so many disabled people. Blind people are falling into the gaps and so on. This is a health and safety issue. I don't even understand how an industry who praises themselves for so long to, to, for health and safety standards and so on, accepted for so long that you have that gaps and that steps and have incidents. They're constantly incidents. It's an open secret in railway that there are accidents happening, that people injure themselves and so on. So the complexity is a problem. Health and safety is a problem. It prevents people from traveling. And if anything goes wrong, even if they did all the right things to plan and to book and whatever, so the burden is with the customer in the first place, by the way, where do we have that? There's no other system where you put the burden of fixing a system on the customer. I'm not using the booking app. I've deleted it last year because I make as many trips as I can without booking to make a point. You don't book before you travel. I don't want to book before I travel. I have a business to run. I don't know how long a meeting takes at an airport, so how should I book that? Tani is in the same position. You say you want more disabled people in employment. Well, that has an impact on my employment, if I have to book a train or not. So you need a rolling stock strategy. Make set a date. 2025, not a single train is bought in this country procured by DFT that has no level access. Yeah. If I may, could I give an example of a country where I visited where I thought the, um, the provision for certainly blind and partially sighted people was exemplary. When I was in Japan, I was on the Tokyo Metro, the tactile paving going into the station, it took you from the pavement, not, not just the platform edge, not just sort of, oh, we'll stop you falling on the platform, hopefully, kind of thing. But, uh, <laughs> see, that's how we have to think. Um, it took you from the, 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 uh, the pavement outside, the tactile pavement took you into the station, it took you to the ticket office, it took you onto the platform, and then there was level boarding at the pla on, on the train. When I got on with assistance, 
I then, and this is an example of how bad um, assistance can be, I count how long it takes for someone to arrive. It, average in the UK, about 10 minutes late. Japan, this lady was six seconds behind the train arriving, and she apologised for being late. Now, I, now I, I said, if I, I, I made some comment to her along the lines of, goodness me, if you're sorry for six seconds late, you should come in the UK, you'll get onto the honours list in no time, because that's fantastic. And even on the bullet trains, assistance was great, level boarding was great. And when I went, I was, we were leaving Hiroshima one time, and I went up to them and said, oh, really sorry, do you mind if we go two hours early? Now, in the UK, well, you should have booked this. Shame on you, sort of, th sort of attitude. Whereas in Japan, it was, yep, yeah, that's just not a problem. And I'm like, well, why is it not a problem? Yeah. And, they were, and the, the very simple response was, because we're here to serve you. And I think that response says it all. It should be about service, not getting stuck behind red, uh, red tape. It shouldn't be about how it looks on one side. It should be about serving disabled people. And I really commend um, Japan, not just generally, but specifically on disability because the attitude and the infrastructure were, were set up to be nothing short of exemplary. Tani, is there anything that yes. you wanted to add on? Thank you. Um, so one train company several years ago sent my picture to uh, quite a significant number of staff and said, if you see this one on the platform, do whatever you can just to get rid of her, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, so Christian's right, you have to be an expert in the system and you have to be an expert in every single mode. And you also have to be an expert in which say train stations or bus stops are accessible because actually a lot of the information held is wrong so uh, a little while ago I was able to book assistance to a train station that was completely inaccessible so the whole information system uh, needs looking at we haven't covered um, bus stops that co cross cycle paths uh, we've we've got some just over Westminster Bridge that actually have an impact on on disabled people um, but sorry slightly bring it back to the app as well we were promised with the app that we'd be able to buy tickets uh, and have functionality. A lot of the train companies don't even use the app, they're developing their own. Um, you have to try and you know, book a cheap ticket and then try and book assistance and hope that you can get it. So the impact it's having is on um, absolute people's mental health and well-being. And I'm the same as, as Alan and others. We want people to travel, but they also have to know a little bit of the reality. So the government strategy of getting more disabled people into work is, is brilliant. I, I massively support it. But unless we, we look at that in the whole round of, of how disabled people are able to get to work, then it's, it's almost impossible to do it. I think certainly I sat on the board of TfL many, many years ago, and the the policy in place at the time, it was only if a disabled person had to spend more than 40 minutes extra travelling, that counted as an inconvenience. Um, so, you know, you know, it maybe should be five minutes, but, but we're constantly dumbing down um, all the expectation of, of disabled people. So, and, and sorry, just picking up on Christian, so it's, you know, level boarding is a must. You know, Mersey Rail, okay, it's a closed loop network, they've been able to do it, but that's fantastic. And, and we should be rolling this out because we, we should be, you know, the purple pounds, the amount of money disabled people have to spend is significant. And if you can't get where you want to go, then, you know, we're, 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 we're losing so many opportunities. So, and, and that impact on disabled people of inaccessible transport is just not being measured because, again, it just doesn't have the priority because it's like, well, you know, what, you want a job, you want to work, oh... You know, I, the, the number of times I've been to a train station and they've said, oh, you're going for a day out. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, you know, and I've had it leaving from here, you know, where I've been criticised for missing my book to sisters. Well, I'm really sorry. I can't dictate what time the chamber finishes, you know, and, you know, it's that that's a constant for, for disabled people. We, we're just there's no expectation of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to, uh, for the record, uh, the point you made about us experiencing uh, mm. journeys, we are endeavouring to do that. Uh, I and a number of my colleagues have, have got uh, made journeys with uh, people with different uh, disabilities uh, so that we can educate ourselves on the, the, the real challenges that, that, that you face. Uh, just before I turn to Greg Smith, Ruth Cadbury wants a very quick supplementary. Thank you. Um, I'm Ruth Cadbury. I'm a Labour MP in uh, West London and I had the honour to travel around central London recently with Alan and also uh, a colleague with an, a non-visible 
impairment, which opened up a whole further series of questions and insights to me as well. Um, the transport authorities and transport companies um, all have equality, diversity and inclusion policies uh, and procedures. And uh, HS2, which obviously is a construction uh, uh, company, um, put its EDI, took it from HR and put it in health and safety. So EDI, so EDI is a core part of their health and safety p policies and procedures. Would that make a difference? <laughs> Maybe, <Sorry>. but... <laughs> I suppose the, ch yeah. the, ch the, 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 ch the challenge is the proof will be in the pudding. I mean, in, th in theory, it sounds fantastic, but it also depends on what that policy actually says. So that's, so that's the other challenge. Um, so, yes, I, I suppose in direct answer to the question, it depends. Mm. Accessibility I, definitely is a health and safety issue. Yeah. I, agree, I agree with that. And um, uh, when I was head of accessibility at GTR, one of the first things we did, I wanted to have a, a, a deep overview where the fate assists are coming from, where they are happening, and especially why. And we used health and safety tools to achieve that. So I see the link, but just to put a policy in another department is not delivering anything. Yeah. The question is, what is the delivery then? What are the processes? And again, is the board of HS2 on board? What's with the directors, CEO, and so on? That's far more important than where the policy is. Mm. Okay. Okay. I wanted to think for a second, because I worked with HS2 a little bit. I'm convinced that they want to deliver an accessible railway. Um, and I think that's the message, certainly my personal message is, all of the senior managers I've met across any transport mode or, or company, and there's quite a few, they want to deliver a good service. It's often about those conflicts that they get with other bits of the business whether that's conflict with health and safety, which is the claim with the mobility scooters, or whether it's conflicts with finance, or engineering, or it always seems to be that accessibility loses those arguments. And until it wins those arguments, as I said earlier, like health and safety does, then we're not going to deliver a properly accessible transport network. The other thing is we're dealing with networks that are 100 or more years old. So we're dealing with deeply embedded barriers. But our solutions are looking at three and five year time scale. Our investment is on three and five years and gets cut the minute there are budget squeezes. Until we start setting an aspiration and sticking to it, the 2030 aspiration for an equal transport system is a great aspiration, but it's not been backed by investment or by, um, by actions. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of promises that Elizabeth Lyme would be step free. And I'm afraid I don't count step free to platform a step free. I think we need to find a, another way of describing it because that doesn't allow independent travel because you're then relying on, on a ramp. So, um, you know, that that's really disappointing. Uh, and you're trying to, Alan's completely right, you're trying to overlay new engineering on an old network um, and I'll believe HS2 is accessible when I see it. 
because there'll be there'll be compromises yeah. because there always are and step free and level boarding is the one that uh, gets gets cut every time perhaps in those circumstances the term can be changed to incomplete step free access so that it that it's clear that it's not total mm. that's the, what came to mind straight away We've still got a good number of questions we want to uh, get through, so if you forgive me, I'm going to move on. Uh, can I turn now to Greg Smith, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Good morning. I'm Greg Smith, the MP for Buckingham. Can I return to the issue of streetscape and the barriers that, that come? Many of you have already spoken eloquently and powerfully about the impact of uh, pavement parking, uh, par cars on the curbs, uh, e-scooters, or I quite liked the term uh, e-fly tipping that was used earlier. So apart from those very practical examples where technological innovation has brought new challenges, etc., can I ask for your viewpoint on how planners, uh, local authorities, town councils, district councils, unitary councils, etc., actually see or understand the streetscape as an issue to be considered from transport planning. Uh, and perhaps to give some flavour to that question, I could give the example of a walk I did with the Guide Dogs charity in Prince's Risborough earlier this year, where there was a there is a raised platform across the road between two platforms, between two, two um, pavements, uh, which is the same material as the pavement. Now, that in many ways, for someone in a wheelchair, is rather convenient, and you, know, you don't have to drop down the curb, and you can get straight across from one pavement to another. For someone blind or partially sighted, there's no distinction between the pavement and that which has moving traffic on it, and people walk straight out into the road. How can we get... Trans, uh, uh, local authorities, planning authorities, and you know, smaller authorities like town councils to properly understand and consider when they're putting in well-intentioned streetscape changes to actually consider the needs of uh, people with, with varying disabilities. I mean, there are standards for that already. But you are absolutely right, the standards are not all, uh, always followed. We had exactly this installation you just described in our street. My partner is blind and I shoot out of the house when I saw what they were doing and I talked to the builders myself and said, hello, there are a lot of blind people in this area. You know that this needs tactile paving. We can't just have that flat and I'm a wheelchair user. So um, there are standards. There are Actually, the UK is quite good when it comes to tactiles on the roads and at curbs and so on. But the, the, uh, um, uh, the local authorities have to follow the standards. Anything else, again, and it becomes a health and safety issue. If a, if a blind person doesn't know if, if he or she is on the pavement or on the road, um, it is really the responsibility of the local authorities to deliver accessibility, and that's a good example. But just to the question, do you think that local authorities do actually see streetscape as a transport issue or do they predominantly see it as a beauty issue or a convenience issue or uh, what, what's your experience around the country bearing in mind there are a lot of different local authorities and planning authorities? Tot totally different. I mean, already in London, you, gave, you go from one borough to, to another one, go to Soho and the world is totally different than in Greenwich. Um, I don't think there's a yes and no answer, it's this way or that way. Um, it, it's a bit of a postcode lottery, you're totally right. And the postcode is changing virtually at every single street. So um, again, enforcement, standardisation uh, is the issue here. Thank you. Tony? Um, Soho, I have to push on the road because there are a few drop curbs. Yeah. Um, and I, I can jump a four inch curb in my chair, but they're, they're too big a lot of them so no I don't think it's considered as a transport issue I think there's been a big impact um, with COVID legislation or post-COVID legislation in terms of um, opening up streets and pavement cafes and certainly as we were coming out of lockdown that was a massive issue for uh, disabled people and, and visually impaired people um, I think if you look at things like drop curbs tactile paving 
Uh, I'll, I'll send the committee a photo, some tactile paving that's recently been put in uh, close to London Bridge that leads a vision impaired person into a wall. Um, and, you know, I'm not really sure what is happening when somebody is laying that and they don't think, hang on a minute, shall I just check that I'm not meant to be guiding a, a visually impaired person in, in, into a wall? Um, you know, we, we've got things like cobbles. Uh, when there's roadworks going on, some of the temporary ramps are actually quite dangerous. Some of the tarmac temporary ramps that put down are even worse. So I don't, yeah, you kind of end up just sort of accepting it because uh, if I haven't got the energy to complain about Mr. Sist, I haven't got the energy necessarily to complain mm -hmm. about that, although I do try to because it's going to impact lots and, and lots of other people. So I don't think that is is considered by most places around the country, to be honest. And it's it's not... It's not deliberate. They're not trying to make our lives more difficult. It's just there's no consideration. It just is never on anyone's priority list to think, oh, hang on a minute, how can I, how, how can I make this a bit better? Thank you. Stephen? I now know to avoid London Bridge on my way home. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I, I should say as a register of interest, I do work for a local, local authority. But what, what, what I would say is that I think often when it comes to this sort of thing, if a disability related question comes up it's often sort of oh yes thank you for that we'll take it into account and then you read the final report six months later and you think you really didn't take that into account yeah. at all did you so ideally and i know this probably isn't going to happen but what i'd love is a veto to be able to say you have to consult disabled people and disabled people have to be happy enough with it i i appreciate that it can't always be a utopia but to be able to say yeah blind and partially sighted people don't think this is dangerous Disabled uh, wheelchair users don't think that this is going to cause an insurmountable, uh, insurmountable obstacle. Something along those lines would be, um, I, I, I think, really, really beneficial. And, and no, I don't, I, I don't think that um, streetscape is properly considered as something where disabled people's needs need to be properly considered. Thank you. Alan? I think mean, it depends on where you are. Certainly Transport for All have done some work with some local authorities who do consider it as a key part of that decision-making process. I think there are, and it's something we've already touched on in other uh, modes, there are rules, regulations, specifications that exist, but they are either not understood or why they're there is understood. So people will design tactile paving in and it meets the standards, but they haven't understood why it's there, so it comes up into a brick wall. Yeah. There I think there's also an issue that different impairments have different and sometimes conflicting requirements. So for Stephen, tactile paving is essential. For me, tactile paving is incredibly uncomfortable. So those are easy questions to answer. So it's easier for those decision makers to not make decisions. There are some really good <coughs> examples a good practice. So at City of London I produced a streetscape tool where you can analyse the impact of different streetscape features and how that affects different impairments, producing a score. So there are processes that are being developed to measure success. I think mean, part of the issue is we can't measure what look what good looks like in so many situations. So there's a, a possible opportunity there um, for improving accessibility through measuring good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if we could now turn to Ben Bradshaw, please. The you all paint is of transport operators routinely breaking the law with impunity. How are they getting away with it? 
Who, why isn't anyone prosecuting them? What are the regulators doing? It's enforcement. That's when a good they... question to ask the regulators. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and which, which regulators in particular should we have our eyes on? Well, I'm here. Right. Does the Equality and Human Rights Commission have a role in this? Um, and what, couldn't they? I mean, surely a disability comes under that. They did a very good inquiry into anti-Semitism in my party, sorted it out, said we've broken the law. Why can't they do something into disability transport? I mean, I, I mean it's a nice idea. I'd kind of quite like it if DFT took a bit more responsibility. Right. Um, personally, I'm not sure it should be to the AHRC to, uh, to, to stand up for rights of disabled people. So um, they, they get away with it because they know they can. Because what you, you usually get an offer is, oh, have a couple of free tickets. Um, oh, you know, we promise will never happen again. They don't have to prove that they've learned anything. Um, they, because of lack of numbers of complaints, they can paint the picture as being not a big issue. Um, and then a couple of people, uh, disabled people, who do take the cases and, and fight them publicly uh, through the court system are often um, berated and lampooned and treated pretty poorly, um, which actually I think sometimes will put other disabled people off taking legal cases. Um, and you know, I've, I've seen how disabled people who do take legal action uh, are, are treated. Um, and just things like ATPs just aren't enforced. So, you know, actually, whether it's OR, you know, um, we could probably have a whole, whole debate on RDG and, and what their role is. Um, you know, actually, I think in terms of rail, um, Great Britain Railways, you know, and their accessibility panel actually has to have some teeth in terms of the built uh, environment accessibility panel of network rail. Is, is quite variable, I think, in terms of and how seriously it's taken. So unless it happens at the highest level, um, I, I think DFT should step up, you know. You, you've, all, you've all described uh, in different ways the um, inadequacy of the complaints system and complaints handling. Are there any examples of good practice that, that we could look at, that we could encourage I think spread off. what is needed for railways is an automatic system, a proper automatic system. So first you need to establish, of course, a system where failed assists are recorded. That is not the case at the moment, at least not with every train operator. So there is not even the data transparency how often disabled people have to face failed assists. They don't get the assistance they have booked or they requested. So if you have that, if the data is there, why don't you compensate the passengers automatically? Because you know when it happened and to whom. So that is what's needed. To rely on disabled people, um, especially people with learning difficulties, to fill in a form and say, hello, I got discriminated or the assistance didn't work, and describe in length what has actually happened. Sorry, that, that is not realistic. And that is also the reason why there is a lack of data. Because, again, the burden is with disabled passengers. If we don't complain, it's not locked anywhere. And even if we do, the last overcarry I had was not even recorded in any railway system. I asked my colleagues, can you please look in the, in, in the log files what they've recorded on this incident? That was an overcarry at South East and going, I, I went to Kent. That's not where I wanted to go. That's where I ended up. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and I asked a colleague to look into the system. They hadn't even recorded it. So where should the data come from? I have to complain. Otherwise, it is not noticed and, and then you still don't have the guarantee that the regulator is aware of it. In aviation, by the way, it's better. If, uh, if you miss your flight or your connection because assistance didn't show up, the airport has the legal obligation to inform the regulator you need the same in railway. Are there any kind of institutional initiatives or that other countries have? I don't know, an independent disability rights commissioner with statutory powers to enforce the law and take up cases that, 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 that provide good models, would provide a good model for the UK, do you know? No, I think some of the policies, I was at a meeting recently where, again, in terms of rail, they're talking about having a booking system where you can drop from 48 hours to 24 hours. So there's some bits that, and I had an example recently where I was at Gardenor, mm. and I was, uh, 
on a train to Schiphol. Um, eventually, at Gardenau, they enabled me to get on the train, and then at Schiphol, they refused to get me off and because I hadn't booked. Um, and so that was even worse. So, uh, uh, and eventually, I basically said, look, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go to Amsterdam Central and come back in 20 minutes, so you either get me off now or you get me off later. So my experience... Um, in, in other countries in terms of rail travel, it's not as great. In terms of airline travel, um, I've rarely had a problem uh, flying around the USA and Canada. Um, but uh, they, they have a different attitude towards disability and you're not treated uh, as an oddity because you want to get on a plane. So um, that, that is, is better. Austria has a very good system in general when it comes to discrimination, where you basically have um, kind of a... It's not a court, but you negotiate with the discriminator at, um, in, this, in this case, it's, it, it's a, national, a federal department, and they get an official letter and get asked to come in, and then you negotiate. You can explain your case and so on. And that is something the UK, I would highly, highly recommend. I took action in Austria myself. I'm not even Austrian, um, uh, but it was so easy and well organized it was impressive and it has an impact a company that have to come to to a department and have to explain to a civil servant what they actually have done that would have an impact and that was a commissioner within the department the transport department was it? Um, had that that, power. in that case it is based in the, that is not just for transport that's for yeah. any discrimination yeah. you have in, in austria mm. so this is then based at the Department for Works and Pension, I think that would be the mm. equivalent in the UK. Mm. But there is a system, and it is very low, there's low barriers to do that. So even me as a foreigner, I was able to do that, and I had a case against, um, I had actually several cases in Austria, against transfer providers in Austria, and um, uh, you don't win the case officially, it's kind of a negotiation, but for me as a disabled person, I went out of the room, I had the feeling I won, I got a compensation, they acknowledged and they, they agreed to changes. And I didn't have to go to, to the court system. So like it's low cost for you? No cost whatsoever. And the government even pays the travel costs to get there because cost is always a problem for yeah. disabled people. Yeah. And um, it, it has really changed the country, I must say. Um, and... and, and uh, it, it makes a, a huge difference. There's still discrimination and there's still unreliabilities and so on. But in general, the system they have introduced in, Ger uh, sorry, in, in Austria, um, the Germans are looking into that as well, is really, really good. It's very low barrier, but it, it, it changes things. Do you think that a managing director of a train operating company would be amused to have to go to, to the Department for Transport, for example, in a meeting and explain themselves why they had the 30th yeah. fate assist? Yeah. That makes an impact. Good, that's I, really... Sorry, Stephen, yeah, go ahead. I, I think, f for me, the, the, the biggest challenge be, beyond the, the, the regulator side of it is the general approach, and, and, I, and I think um, transport companies know this, that when they see it as a customer service issue, rather than a discrimination issue, that causes all sorts of problems. When I had somebody hurl abuse at me on the train a couple of weeks ago, and I sort of reported it and said, I want you to do something, a couple of people went down, and they, they, they just told him to settle the, and, and this was after he'd said to me, and I quote, you're not fucking blind. Um, it, the the, the um, Transport for London just said, oh, um, yeah, well, we've, we, we've just asked him to settle down. And I went, have you called the police? This is a hate issue. And I went, no. That, that should be automatic. That, if, if there is an incident of hate that should be taken out of my hands and the police called immediately. The other problem was that there were no help points. And I couldn't call anybody. There should be good tactile paving to get me to a help point where I can request help immediately. And then in turn, if that doesn't work, if this doesn't occur, I have a way of properly following this up. At the moment, I have the voice message or voicemail on my phone just saying, we're going to do nothing, sorry about that, goodbye. And the same with when somebody made a comment a few years ago saying, um, this, this is a mem member of assistance staff, what, why are you travelling on your own? You should know, if, if you can't travel on your own, you shouldn't be out in public. But I had nowhere following that up. I had nowhere saying that is outrageous and I'm not going to stand for it. The police a couple of weeks ago said to me, well, if you get another incident, can you follow the person and then we'll track them down? I'm not following someone who, in one case, assault, I'm not following someone who's assaulted me. 
There's just no follow-up. There's no teeth. There's no backbone. There's no substance. So, yeah, I, th I think I've said all, everything that I'm going to say on a, that. An apologies, Stephen. I didn't introduce myself. Ben Bradshaw, the MP for Exeter. Alan, anything you wanted to add about regulation or good models of regulatory and complaint systems? I mean, the thing that I'd like to highlight is, and again, we've touched on this a bit, it's down to the individual knowing what their rights are, yeah. knowing what they're entitled to, knowing what they can expect. So many disabled people put up with appalling service because they just don't know that they're entitled to more and they don't know where to go to complain. You go to, for example, the rail ombudsman, they're not interested in accessibility issues. It's not, they're not about solving the problem. And most disabled people don't want money. We don't want compensation. We want things to get fixed. Yeah. But actually we're paid off. Thank you. Um, just finally, a number of you have, have, have said the situation has got much, much worse since COVID, either because you don't think staff are being, or there are new staff who haven't been trained properly, but it seems to me to be a much more fundamental problem from COVID. What's your explanation for this? Has the company taken that off the ball? Is it a financial issue? Stephen? Uh, Alan, sorry? I think a lot of it's had to do with training and exposure. Because disabled people haven't been out, because the transport operators haven't been able to do that equality training, people have forgotten how to behave. And that's what's, yeah, that, that's resulted in the appalling uh, just things getting worse. What COVID has shown us, and the, the benefit for me from COVID, is that so often when we ask for something, we're told it, we can't do it. It costs too much. It's against the rules. Um, it's against the regulations. COVID taught us but where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Not only to change, but to change really, really quickly. Yeah. So it can be done, it's just a lack of impetus. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Greg Smith, if you uh, Thank you, Chairman. Greg Smith, uh, again. Uh, can I uh, ask you, you've all painted a, a, a really grim picture of the way you're all treated and the way complaints are dealt with uh, and received, which is clearly unacceptable and something has to change. In the written evidence that we've received as a committee, we have seen evidence that suggests that on top of the appalling scenarios you have all described to us this morning, uh, people with um, uh, less visible uh, disabilities, neurodivergence, etc., are taken even less seriously when it comes to complaints. Um, in your experience, do, do you all uh, have that same view? Uh, and do you think that, that there are certain other avenues beyond that which we've already discussed this morning that transport operators, local authorities, public services and private services alike need to be considering when it comes to hidden disabilities. Christian? I think if the culture of an organisation is all right, is customer-centric, customer-focused, it doesn't even matter if the impairment is visible or not. Mm. It is a very artificial way to uh, look at disability. It's in fact how non-disabled people see us. For obviously for non-disabled people it seems to be important if the disability is visible or not. 
for us, at least for me, it's not important. I have uh, non-visible impairments on top of my spinal cord injury. Most of other disabled people have. You hardly have just one impairment and that's it. Um, and especially with age, we are aging as well. So it's, we are not just because we are disabled, we are not getting age affected. So that's not how the world works. Um, it comes to the culture of the organization. If someone comes to me and, and asks me, what is the bus number of this bus? And the bus driver responds, can't you see that? No, I can't, I'm short-sighted. Uh, so if you have a customer-focused approach and culture, and that is filtered through through the front line. It doesn't even matter because he will friendly answer the question if that impairment is visible or not. If the culture in the organization is all right, if the recruitment is correct, if not the cousin gets hired because uh, the other cousin works already in the same organization. So it is a cultural issue first and foremost if we get service customer focused organizations it should not matter if the, dis if the impairment is visible or not. Tony. Yes, what she said. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, this may be controversial, but I am not a fan of the sunflower lanyards. Yeah, um, Because agree. it's about labelling people uh, yes. in different ways. Uh, and for me, it's got to be about just treating everybody uh, with a little bit more respect. Now, whether that's an older person travelling who may need a little bit of help with a suitcase or something like that. Actually, it's, it's the culture which need, needs to be looked at and assessed. Uh, and, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, when I sat on the Board of Transport for London, uh, Peter Hendy, now Lord Hendy, used to make every board member do frontline gate duty. And doing six hours at London Bridge Station is really eye-opening in terms of how members of staff are, are, are treated. Um, but that doesn't mean that actually disabled people or people with invisible impairments um, shouldn't have the same right to, to travel as, as everyone else. So in addition to my visual impairment, I have Asperger's syndrome, mm -hmm. which for those who don't know is a, is a form of autism. Um, I, I find particularly people grabbing me very distressing. So yeah. this, what happened this morning outside was particularly distressing. But I find that people don't listen to me when I ask them to let go. I have got to the point where I have to threaten to hit them to be in with a chance. And I've had to do that multiple times. And I, re I don't like threatening to hit people. I really don't want to do it. But we've got to the point where we have to kind of stand up for ourselves in a really forceful yeah. way. And I, I, that, that I find particularly distressing. And it, it, it comes back to this whole thing about customer service-led, client-led, not getting stuck behind red tape, not get, getting stuck behind policy. If I say not to touch me, it's a basic issue of respect. Yes. Don't touch me. It's that simple. But people seem to just think uh, um, dis disability and passenger assistance in particular as, oh, we've, we've written a nice policy, I've done the training, marvellous, as opposed to how can I help you? And that's a really big thing. That should be embedded into not just policies but in the psyche. That's very helpful, thank you. Alan? Disabled people can be a target. Yeah. They can be... Uh, the risk of being attacked or assaulted is almost always there. Certainly I've had people <coughs> try and move me out of the wheelchair space on a train, physically lift me up and move me because they wanted to be there. They failed. I'm heavier than they thought I was. Um, but I can't hide that I'm a disabled person. I'm very obvious. But a lot of people don't want to wear the sunflower lanyards. A lot of solutions for these issues that we face are increasingly technology-based. But a lot of disabled people don't want to stand in a public space with their mobile phone trying to access assistance or tickets yeah. or because they both feel vulnerable. So it comes down to what Christiane said. If you treat, it's down to 
customer service. Don't separate out disability as a special treatment. Mm. Treat everybody in and just the best customer service will solve so many of the issues that we face. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. If you turn now to Mike Kingsbury. Thank you. So it's Mike Gamesby. I'm the Member of Parliament, Labour Member of Parliament for Weaver Vale in the North West. Uh, I'm going to focus on, on legislation. Um, the first question is, is legislation covering access to transport, is it comprehensive enough? Um, I'll start with yourself, Alan. Um, I've got a knowledge of the bits of the legislation that I've come up against. So I think that's something that a lot of disabled people find. They get to know in quite detail the bits that they've had to fight. Because you have to know it to be able to argue it. So I know I know a lot about a little. So I, my feeling is that no, it's not comprehensive enough. Uh, my feeling is that it's not detailed enough. So, for example, the 2017 Pauline uh, V First Bus that I know the committee is aware of, one of the comments in the judgment was that legislation should be enacted to uh, prioritise the wheelchair space on the bus. We are now, what, six, six years, seven years later, and that hasn't changed. That's still a fight that we're all having every day. So, no, the legislation, I don't believe, is comprehensive, but even the legislation that we've got isn't good enough and isn't being um, properly enforced. Thank you. Steve? Short answer is no, uh, both, both in terms of the legislation doesn't cover everything that it should, but also the stuff that's there. It's very hard to enforce, and even when it is enforced, it doesn't really have the kick that I feel that it needs to. Take, for example, private hire vehicles, sections 169 and 167, uh, just 169 and 170 of the Equality Act. That's an example of the laws we have to know. Yes. Um, it's a level three fine. No automatic process, that that's, equates to about a thousand pounds fine. There's no automatic revocation of your license, and you have to do all the legwork. So I think having an automatic revocation, and ideally a level four fine, possibly level five, would be much more suitable in my humble opinion. Also the fact that cruise liners are not covered by equality legislation in terms of transport, that really disturbs me and I think that really needs to be tightened up. Indeed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we talked about before, does cover cruise liners that dock in the United States. Um, also I think having mandatory help points that are manned somewhere not at a call centre at uh, the other end of the country, which will be picked up in five minutes. That would be helpful, not just when there are assistance fails, and I understand that they may go wrong from time to time, but also when there are instances of abuse that need to be dealt with immediately. I think those three things would help me, as a, as a disabled person, provided they are enforced properly, to feel much more confident and get rid of what, what um, Gavin Neat has referred to as arrival anxiety. Great, thank you. Uh, Baroness Gray Thompson. Thank you. Uh, no, um, so uh, the inclusive uh, transport strategy, regrettably, is just another strategy, uh, and disabled people are slightly bored by strategies. Um, so uh, it keeps seeming to be done to us all the time, and not much actually happens. So for me, I think the government needs to take equal access uh, seriously. Uh, we need action and investment, uh, and if I stick with railways, you know, in terms of delivering an inclusive uh, system, 
it's got to be fit for purpose for future generations, and what we currently have just doesn't cover that. So we, we've got to stop allowing derogations. Um, you know, so the current legislation isn't effective. So look at rolling stock derogations. Uh, the class uh, 158 have a narrow entrance vestibule, which prevents mobility scooters using from accessing them. So it's not just Scott Rail that bans mis- mobility scooters. Um, it's Northern Trains as well. Um, so you know, it's that there needs to be a step by step plan, you know, to to actually take action, not just keep kicking it into the long grass. So the short answer is no. What we have is, um, even if what we have was used properly, it's not enough, and and ultimately, it's not enough. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, uh, I agree. No, um, I think the ATP guidance is a go- uh, of the ORR. It's a good example that it can be done. The direction is already there, but it has to get enforced and it has to get a bit stricter and, and, and stronger. Um, I think we have to move away that um, disabled people have to take action to enforce the law. That is not a concept. Um, that is really the, 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 the task of the government and no one else. It's not, I don't, I'm not the regulator. The regulator for railways, the ORR, for aviation, the CAA, they have to be able to do that. And um, just one uh, good point about derogations. Derogations also happening when it comes to building stations and building uh, transport infrastructure. Um, I didn't even know the term before I joined Railway and was gobsmacked to hear that we have a brilliant standard that DFT had set, a brilliant accessibility standards that then gets watered down in the project meetings. Mm. Oh no, don't worry about it, we go for derogation. Mm. I didn't even know what that was. So it, it was beyond my imagination that we have rules, mm-hmm. they're really, they're good, I would even say the standard is quite good, but then Network Rail can go for derogation and Everyone in the room agrees to that. That was exactly the culture I meant before. We can't just water it down and think accessibility is a gold-plated something that is optional. Stop the derogations in the building area um, as well. Not just in the rolling stock, stop it in building as well. You build substandard stations otherwise. It's, it's a common theme, isn't it? Enforcement, lack of enforcement, and, and, and no teeth. Um, earlier on, um, um, one of our committee members referred to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. What, what's your understanding of what their role should be and how effectively they're, they're delivering that? I'm, I'm going to start with you, Christine. <laughs> To be honest, I, I, I don't have a real answer. I don't uh, perceive them as a strong uh, tool to enforce accessibility at the moment. I, I don't see that they are doing that yet um, and that it has an impact. They are hardly discussed in the industry, mm. not in aviation, not in railway. Um, if I don't mention them in meetings, it never comes up. And the cases they had in transport, I think... Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a, a, an expert in, in the Quality Human Rights Commission, are a couple of years old minimum. So from my perspective, I, I don't think they play a huge role at the moment. Um, if they should be, I don't know. I, I still think that accessibility is a health and safety and, and rights issue which should be enforced like any other uh, aviation and railway uh, regulation as well, and that's the role of the regulator and the DFT. Um, the DFT is also the buyer and the, 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 the money giver, so to say, so they should have an own interest that they get the best value for money for the taxpayer. That's also a topic. Not sure if, it's, if that has much to do with the Equality Human Rights Commission. I think money talks here as well. Why are we building substandard stations? Hmm. Yes. I, I don't think I've ever heard the HRC used as much around transport as I have today, so it's really interesting. Yes. It's, it's not um, an option I've ever really thought about, and I kind of work in, in this space. So to me, it's just a different form of derogation. If we kick it to EHRC to take cases, it is actually stopping the DFT from uh, stepping up to what I see is, is their responsibility. So, um, you know, my strong preference was DFT, you know, steps up and actually 
does what it, it, it should be doing. So I was one of those people that argued in the early 90s that we needed an Equality Act, that disability discrimination legislation and the DDA wasn't the best way to go forward because we'd always um, be a game of top trumps. The reality is that what we've seen with equality legislation is disabilities a forgotten part of that and gets a much lower profile uh, compared. And, and sadly, there is a game of top trumps with protected characteristics and disability is, you know, 20% of the population just doesn't get, you know, talked about, it, it doesn't get talked about in education or in transport or in, you know, it, it just gets forgotten. So um, I, I don't think EHRC is, personally, is, is, is the right option. Um, DFT need to be the, the, the organisation, the, the body that, that oversees this. So uh, a few okay. years ago I put out a tweet just going, I've had a discriminatory incident, I'm struggling to get anywhere, does anybody have any contacts with the Equality and Human Rights Commission that they could recommend? And one person came back and said, don't bother, they've got absolutely no teeth, they won't listen to you, they're a complete waste of time, and I think that tells you everything you need to know. Okay, thank you. And finally, Alan. I read the EHRC submission to the committee yeah. with interest. Um, I'm aware that their remit covers transport. I don't know anybody that's had a positive engagement with them on it. I know from their submission that I think they did a project over a couple of years that raised, and I might be wrong in this, but Look it up, but I think it was 30, 35 cases. Stephen, remind us how many legal cases have you personally taken? Um, so I've successfully prosecuted 20 um, private hire drivers. There are currently 23 waiting to be heard, um, and I have settled with five or six other people in the transport sector. So arguably, Stephen's impact is greater than the EHRC. Yes, and, and, that, and that's to actually... <laughs> and that's, I'll take that. You're welcome. Yes, so your fundamental, fundamental right to, as a person, as a customer, to go from A to B to access transport, and yet the Human Rights Commission just don't seem to... It, it's, it's not on the barometer. That's right. not a route that I would pursue. Right, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, if we could turn back now to Graham Morris. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, Graham Morris uh, from Easington. I mean, you've covered some of the ground in the question I was going to ask, but I just want to explore it a, a, a little more. Um, Tani, you were quite damning in your assessment of the inclusive transport strategy, mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's a case of paralysis by analysis. We have so many policies and strategies. But I, I do think my colleagues were trying to be helpful there in the in the reference to um, other levers that might be applied to the Department of Transport. H however, on, on the issue um, of equality impact assessments, because you said you thought it was an equality issue, Stephen said, I thought it was interesting earlier, he thought it was a discrimination issue. You know, often these matters are dealt with as a customer services issue. But is it, could that be part of the solution? By the time some of these policies and procedures filter down into reality and that day-by-day -day lived experience, it just gets watered down so much. So, you know, over the years, I've seen some great strategies, but do they change my day-to-day -day experience of travelling? Not really. Well, that's, so the, that's the yardstick, <laughs> isn't it? That's it's, it's the bit, evidence. Yeah. Do the policies and the intention, I mean... The road to hell's paved with good intentions, isn't it? Yeah. But you know, are the policies and the enforcement working in a way that makes a difference to people's everyday lived experience, disabled people's experience? I mean, I was just thinking my journey down to London I had a terrible time on the uh, Northern Rail service. Mm. There's only two carriages. Mm. It was bad enough for me, but I, I, I could stand even with my bad leg. But anybody who had graded degrees of disability and mobility issues couldn't get on the train. And I think their choices are informed by that experience, so they, they don't try. You, you use some 
alternative method or they don't travel. So if we were talking about the extra cost of being disabled, I live in the northeast of England, I work in London, I moved house to be closer to an accessible, which is at the moment, train station, Eagles Cliff. That's my title, so people know where I live. Um, there's currently a ramp, there's discussions about whether that ramp's going to be removed and lift put in, which is kind of interesting. Um, the, the extra cost of doing that and the extra cost of living near an accessible tube station in London can be £150,000 more than a non-disabled person. So, uh, and so there's all these things. I, I do have to, I use Grand Central a lot. They're really good. Yeah. But because there's six trains a day and I know every single member of staff. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, and but but that's not what should it, it it should be based on. So, you know, it's because they know me. Most of my good experiences are because people know me. Um, so the reality is, no, I don't think it filters down far off. So there's people; they're not trying to be malicious, but it's just what well, ignorance or it's a, lack of understanding. Or, yeah, and just you know, people are busy and they're trying to do different things and they're stressed in their daily life, and we we're, we're just not part of. We're not on people's horizon in terms of what what you know what we're trying to do um, and we're not seen as a at worst we're not seen as a an integral part of society and if you take it back to covid at its worst the fact that do not attempt resuscitation orders were put on tens of thousands of disabled people without their knowledge or discussion actually that shows what society thinks of of disabled people um sorry that's quite a global statement but then we go tiny 12 was lovely um so you know, until it becomes a high enough priority, things, sadly, they're, they're not going to change. Actually, what we need is we need a Secretary of State who's disabled. Uh, and well, we might be able to arrange that for you. So, <laughs> but, but, but someone who, who knows it, 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 it kind of just has that kind of awareness. That's when we'll, we'll see, I think, some real... Or d- disabled people. So there's lots of, you know, committees and, and bodies that are advisory that again can just just get ignored but without disabled people being around the table and this is why today is so important um, without listening to the voices of disabled people then things won't change yeah, yeah. well that's the whole purpose the, the, the committee inviting you and you, your voices are very important and valued thanks very much Chair thank you Graham. and for our final um, set of questions uh, over to Ruth Cadbury uh, thank you. We briefly touched with the Vienna example to do with a national um, legal culture uh, that, that has led to improvements uh, on services in Austria. But are there any other examples of good practice um, from the UK or elsewhere uh, where things are significantly better than the generality and the experiences you've described today? And, and what made the difference in those cases? Um, uh, anybody want to indicate? Uh, I can I can um, tell you about yeah. Vienna again, yeah. and that's just a co- <laughs> that's just a coincidence. But Vienna, the city of Vienna, um, they have only accessible tube stations, and that wasn't the case 30 years ago. They um, they started a huge program to make every single tube station accessible, and I think that is needed for London, but that is needed for the UK nationwide as well. And is that integrated across the whole transport network, including the sort of... That is the 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 tube in Vienna, but they have... And I love this example so much, because very often in London you hear, yeah, but we are the oldest tube in the world, and it's so difficult. Vienna is only 20 years younger, so that can't be the argument. Um, I think it is a matter of political will. They have shown... And I think Italy has a similar system for the whole country. I don't know where that is now, to be fair. I don't know. But they have a roadmap, and I think that is the right approach. New York has just announced their roadmap to make the metro fully accessible by 2050. And disabled people applauded that. So it is not, we are not, we know how difficult it is. We know it needs time. But it needs a roadmap. If you don't have a plan, you will never end up anywhere. We don't even have a plan at the moment. So if you don't have a plan how to make this country's railway station accessible, you will never achieve that. With a ring fence budget, with a, with a um, cross-party commitment for the next 30 years that no one touches. Or where they know, if they touch it, 
that the society-wide outcry will be so bad that they don't touch it. That is what is needed. You need a plan. A strategy is never enough. Thank you. Any other uh, examples of uh, good where it works well, of good practice? Well, I, I come back to what I said earlier about Japan, in particular Tokyo. So um, step-free access at every station on the metro, um, tactile pavement from pavement to platform, including off, offshoots to the ticket office. The attitude of the staff as well. When, when I had this thing where I went, can I go on a train a little bit earlier? Yeah, it's not a problem. I asked them, why is that not a problem? Because in the UK, we'd probably get shouted at for that. And she just went, we are here to serve. And that, that I think, sums it up. So there's not just a point about New York and having an infrastructure plan set in for 2050, which, which, would, be, which would be very useful. Incidentally, uh, when I went to a public consultation for my local station, Harrow on the Hill, when they were doing step-free access, and I talked about making the whole network accessible, and one of the people said to me from TfL, uh, it's never going to be full of, fully accessible and you need to get over it. His exact words. Okay. So I think that it's, it's not just the infrastructure, it's the attitude, it's the approach, and seeing it as really about valuing disabled people, not just seeing them as some sort of commodity who has to be, as has been referred to before, paid off, told to shut up, or just have to be told that you're going to be unequal and just go back in your little cubby hole. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. Let's make that clear. So I, except you want to go everywhere. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. I've, I've had some really good experience in the USA. I have some great experiences fly in and trains in Spain. Um, I think we need to be looking at the Netherlands uh, because they've got some really bold plans to ensure that its entire railway network, that's I mean, 410 stations, is going to be fully independently accessible to everyone by 2030. So. Yeah, that, that's a really important place to look at. Anything, will, isn't it? You can do anything, a anything you want to, to add, Alan? I think there are opportunities. It's not just about big ticket items. It's not just about lifts and station yeah. rebuilds. There are all sorts of good examples of little initiatives. Like? Like, for example, I think it's from memory, Transpennine had just released a video tour of a number of their stations so that people who are nervous can, through this VR <coughs> system, look around the station and know where all of the facilities are. It's the, the issue is. People aren't good at sharing those ideas, and they're not good at critically analysing their own efforts. I think somebody in a bus company has said to me, accessibility should not be an issue and competitive advantage. These solutions, we know they're out there. They should be shared. Um, Notability have just set up and funded a centre for investigating uh, evidence gathering. We know the evidence, we know the solutions, we just need them implemented. Thank you. And finally, preferably in a sentence, what one thing would make the biggest difference to the ability of people with access needs to travel when and where uh, they want or need to? Um, I'll start with Alan. Oh, I was hoping you would tell the last. Okay, I'm, okay. Um, no, that's fine. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go the other way. Shall I, I'll go to Christiane then and come back this way. Okay, accountability and responsibility by people in charge at a very high level will make a huge difference. Okay. As long as no one is responsible, as long as everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. Okay, Tani? Level boarding. Hmm? Level, Level boarding. boarding. Okay, Stephen? Change the law, change the approach, change the standards, and respect that I know my needs better than anybody else on the planet. Good point. And Alan? Okay. Train everybody, not just the frontline staff, but train the directors, the managers, the
the project managers, the accountants, everybody needs accessibility at the heart of their job, just like health and safety. And that's the point we covered when we met before, including the designers, the architects, the interior decks people, and the that, equipment designers. And that training needs to be led by disabled people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, and that brings us to the end of this session. Um, can I thank all four of you most sincerely uh, for your time uh, this morning, uh, but also sharing your own experiences and suggestions. Uh, they've been uh, incredibly helpful uh, to this inquiry and will give us a number of areas uh, that we want to pursue uh, with the other witnesses uh, in future sessions. Um, and you know, please, I know a number of you have sent in written uh, evidence already, but if there is anything you'd like to follow up upon, um, uh, please uh, do feel free to, to do so. And finally, Stephen, again, if I can repeat the apology for the, the experience you had uh, in coming into Parliament this morning. Uh, that wasn't acceptable, and I can assure you we will be following it up. Uh, well, may, may I just say one thing to perhaps end, end on a happy note? Um, what I'm going to say at first isn't happy, but it, it will turn into happy. As some of you may know, Barney is retiring in the next couple of weeks, uh, so his, his career as a guide dog will be finished. Um, me and Barney have come and sat in the public gallery on many occasions and heard m many of you talking. Um, Barney's been asleep for much of that, but, and I, I, I hope that doesn't offend any of you. But I just wanted to place on record, generally, today being an exception, how accessible uh, Parliament has been to me and to Barney and I want to place on record um, my thanks to the parliamentary staff for all that they do to make my experience um, in Parliament, particularly visiting the House of Commons, an accessible one and just to thank Barney for, um, for everything and for seven and a half years of a wonderful partnership. Thank you. And, and Barney has behaved impeccably uh, throughout. I've been keeping my eye on him uh, during the proceedings. Uh, and, and, and we wish him, we, we, his ears are picking up a little, we wish him a, a long and happy retirement. Uh, but once again, thank you all uh, for your time and evidence this morning. Order, order.